Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! to get through today. I don't know if you've seen this report in the Financial Times about, um, well, I suppose we have to describe it as a party, but it appears to be pretty close to a sort of uh, a bacchanalian orgy of sorts, or at least a lot of the men attending hoped it would become so. Um, I've rarely felt so naive in my life. We'll find out a little bit more about that later in the programme, and I am drawn for a whole heap of reasons to a story you heard Nick mention about a top school um, banning pupils from having relationships. Uh, I, I think that could be a really interesting conversation. Um, this particular head teacher has threatened to expel pupils in the school who have relationships in the sixth form. Part of me wonders whether, actually, if I'd had a girlfriend at my boarding school, um, it might have actually helped me avoid getting expelled. So, uh, lots of different angles to come on that issue. But we begin, because sadly we have to, with Brexit. David Davis is currently appearing before the Brexit Select Committee. Theo will keep us up to speed on developments there. I saw, because I, I missed it at the time, because it was posted on Christmas Eve, um, a picture of him released by his own department in which it is claimed that he is discussing opportunities um, caused by Brexit with researchers at, at Cancer Research in Cambridge. So just because um, we presume it was just an error of omission, we've put in a little request to the department this morning to tell us what those opportunities were that he was discussing. Because otherwise, uh, to put out a picture of him talking to a scientist and claiming they were discussing Brexit opportunities uh, without there actually being any Brexit opportunities, that would be pretty close to government-funded propaganda. So I'll be happy to clarify that on your behalf later this morning um but here's the thing all right and as as with all of this stuff it, it's, it's very important to get the variables established first here are some facts the office of budgetary responsibility uh has an executive responsibility i know this because i've been on their website this morning uh, it's important. It's the only way you can be sure of getting things absolutely right is, is to go straight to the source, as it were, straight to the horse's mouth. And, and pay attention. I'm hoping we can do this hour with contributions from all corners of, of the Brexit battlefield. But there are some things that we all have to agree on first, and that would be a basic topography of the battlefield. So here's the quote. The OBR has an executive responsibility to the Chancellor of the Exchequer to deliver the fiscal and economic forecasts he needs to take tax and spending decisions, right? So the the numbers, if you like, that the Chancellor uses to make his budget come from the Office of the Budget Responsibility, which is an independent organisation set up, I think, it, it, relatively recently, within the last 10 years, featuring three members of, of the Bank of England's uh, monetary what's its committee and um, they give the Chancellor their best estimates on where we're going economically. Incredibly difficult job at the moment because until we know what our post-Brexit landscape is going to look like it's, it's it, arguably a hiding to nothing but oddly, or not oddly but what I didn't know is that the Chancellor of the Exchequer is legally obliged to employ these numbers. So they are, and cabinet ministers are, are uh, entitled to dispute them. That's that's the other thing about a forecast; it can't be uh, set in stone. So pay attention at the back. The Chancellor of the Exchequer is duty-bound to use the economic forecasts of this independent agency, the Office of Budgetary Responsibility, OK? And under the terms of those forecasts, then we are looking at... And, and just remember, this isn't me speaking. These are the numbers the Chancellor has to use. And if they turn out to be spectacularly wrong, two things will happen. The first is that they will almost have predicted themselves out of existence. They have an existential responsibility, if you like, to be as accurate as they can, but they can never be infallible. Um, and then, of course, depending on whether they turn out to be uh, enormously wrong in an upwards direction or a downwards direction, we'll have cause to either gnash our teeth even more than we are already or celebrate the, the, the success that currently nobody is able to describe. So they estimate that by the mid-2020s, which might sound like a long way ago, uh, a long way away until you actually start counting, by the mid-2020s, we'll be looking at, and this is under a relatively favourable post-Brexit deal, we'll be looking at about £15 billion a year 
less coming in through the tax takes that the organisation that the Chancellor of the Exchequer uses to write his budgets predict. That is, in total, more than the United Kingdom's current net contribution to the European Union. So but I think it's, it's a little bit misleading to, to try to poo-poo completely that £350 million pound figure. But that's the gross figure. The net figure is considerably less than that. But we don't have control over the... If you, if you say there's £100 uh, million a week difference, we don't have control over that. It, it, it never leaves our shores. It's a, it's a rebate. But it isn't money that we have full control over. In, in, in the same way that, you know, if, if, if you're paying your membership for a club and you get, a, I don't know, a long service reward so you don't have to pay um, as much next year, but you, you pay your full amount and get some money back or you get given a free month, it's, it's in their gift. It's not in your control. It might sound nuanced, but I, I think it's important to at least try to see the world as others see it. So what we've got then now, if, 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 if I've said anything wrong, 0345 973 The office that the Chancellor of the Exchequer relies upon to set his budgets, budgets under which every single member of Cabinet then has to operate, have forecast that by the mid-2020s we will be taking in less money in tax, the figure that will have diminished is greater than the figure we currently pay to the European Union, OK? Let's not even mention all the stuff that is currently paid for by with European Union money, all the regulations, all the agencies that are supranational, all the things that the European Union pays for using in part money that we pay to them uh, and that we then benefit from, all of which we're going to have to replace. We're going to have to have our own regulatory agencies when we know what our regulatory alignment is going to look like. With all of this stuff, you can see why the newspapers don't go near this, can't you? It's complicated. It's not really. But, but it is complicated if you want to deal in six-foot-high words of one syllable. So, the Chancellor of the Exchequer relies upon numbers provided by an agency that has an executive duty to uh, provide these forecasts, under which every single Cabinet Minister operates, and under which we will not have any surplus money in the mid-2020s as a result of leaving the European Union. Now, it's also worth pointing out that this can change. So while the uh, ministers in Cabinet are allowed to um, uh, not accept or argue with these numbers, they're not allowed to put actions where their words are. They have to abide by the budget that the Chancellor sets. And that means that any talk of a Brexit dividend is complete bonklessness. It, I mean, it is just beyond reality. So Boris Johnson yesterday, Liam Fox today, talking about there being... How are we going to describe it? Because, I mean, what would, it, what would we call it in our normal life? It's like a Brucey bonus. The idea is that after this process of departure, there will be more money coming into the Treasury coffers than there is currently, to the tune, for the sake of argument and buses, to the tune of 350 million quid that we will then be able, forgetting that, of course, um, we also have subsidies that go into farming, we've got subsidies that go into fishing, we've got European Union money that's spent on, on infrastructure projects throughout these islands. All of that needs to be replaced as well. But let's pretend even that doesn't exist and focus exclusively on the money that... that could go to the NHS. Let's pretend it could all go to the NHS. Now, the agency that the Cabinet relies upon for its economic forecast has said there won't be any. So what I want you to do today is explain to me how a Cabinet Minister like Liam Fox or a Foreign Secretary like Boris Johnson is allowed to tour the studios and talk about a dividend that their own economic forecasts, the government's own economic forecasts, which the Chancellor is duty-bound to follow, I think legally obliged to cut his cloth according to the OBR forecasts. How can Boris Johnson and Liam Fox be allowed to talk about money that doesn't exist making its way to the NHS? I don't... I've just realised at 13 minutes after 10 that you're not going to be able to answer that question. Nobody is. And that's where we are. The only thing you've got, presumably, is to accept that the Chancellor has to set all of his budgets according to the Office of Budgetary Responsibility, uh, but somehow also argue at the same time that we shouldn't be trusting the Office of Budget Responsibility and there will be lots of money because, well, there just will be fingers crossed. That this is a collapse 
in accountability. This is a genuine democratic deficit. Cabinet ministers allowed to talk about a Brexit dividend that their own number crunchers have concluded could never exist. And that's where we are. So, bearing in mind that I don't think anybody can really explain to me how we've allowed ourselves to be reduced to such a bunch of credulous lemmings, I would like you to explain to me how you think this has happened. How have we ended up in a position where... Because this allows everybody to contribute, including people who, who want to claim that they have a better understanding of international economics than the people at the Chancellor of the Exchequer has to rely upon. Although you'll allow me to, to bring a degree of scepticism to anybody making that claim. How do you think we've ended up in a place where Liam Fox and Boris Johnson can talk about a Brexit dividend, in other words, extra money that we will have, when the numbers that their own Chancellor has to use to set the budgets for their own departments tell us there'll be a net loss after we leave? That, oh man, sometimes when I say this stuff out loud, I, 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 well, I have two thoughts. Please, God, I'm wrong. But the other thought is bleak with a capital B, isn't it? Because it gets reported in the newspapers and by some, but not all, broadcast organisations. It gets reported without question, without query. And yet, there is only one OBR. <laughs> there can be only one OBR. And there is only one uh, agency that the Chancellor uses when he's writing his budgets and his budget statements. And the only numbers he's allowed to use tell us there won't be any money left over for a Brexit dividend. But Boris Johnson is allowed to, to ride roughshod over the British public, backed up by Liam Fox, the Secretary of State for International Trade that he's not allowed to do until the terms of our departure from the European Union have been defined and signed off. God knows what he does with himself all day. You have this incredible vista now opening up in front of you where some of those things that used to sound a little bit over the top when you described Orwellian doublethink and you, you described Orwellian manipulation of truth and fact, it, 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 it seems to me to be pretty much close to reality. Also announced in the last couple of days that Number 10 are going to launch some sort of fake news unit while the Foreign Secretary is marching up and down the country claiming that money the Office of Budget Responsibility says won't exist could be spent upon the NHS? I mean, if that's not fake news, then what is? In fact, that, that's a demonstrable deceit. Demonstrable. Here he is saying, we will have this money. Here is the OBR saying, no, we won't. Who are you going to trust? A former journalist who prepared two articles on the eve of announcing his support for the Leave campaign, the unpublished one of which explained his reasons for remaining, or an independent Bank of England <coughs> staffed committee that would talk itself out of existence if its forecasts were found to have been avoidably wrong. So do we now draw a line down the middle of the country, or at least <coughs> the portion of the country listening to this programme? Do we now draw the line down the middle of this country and say, on the one side, you, you, you work with whatever estimates are available, even though you accept that they will be fallible. Or, on the other side, you just believe what you want to believe and ignore all of the uh, forecasts and all of the experts and all of the predictions. Because they will be fallible, trust none of them. In which case you have to explain to me why on earth Philip Hammond follows OBR forecasts when writing every syllable of budgets for the British government. Do you know, when I started talking 13 or 14 minutes ago, I, I, I had a hope that I'd unravel this in the course of explaining it to you and that it wouldn't look as bleak and as Orwellian as it did when I opened my gob. That hasn't worked out very well. Maybe you can uh, pour some oil upon the waters of my discombobulation. 0345 is the number that you need. The question is simple. Could you explain to me how our country has ended up being a place where a cabinet minister can march around claiming to have money to spend on something that the agency which advises the Chancellor on matters fiscal says doesn't exist. Boris Johnson says we've got this money to spend. The Chancellor of the Exchequer's advice is we'll have less than we have now. How, how have we ended up in such an almighty... Oh, I shall use the word pickle, because I think it deserves a, 
A bit of a resurgence. It's 10.18. Hit the numbers now. You will get through. 0345 6060 I'll take a couple of calls from people saying, oh, you can't trust the OBR. But I will reserve the right to ask you who you do trust and how you feel about the fact that that is the Chancellor's sole source for fiscal forecasting. It's 10.19. If you missed my introduction, I'll give you the short version. How can Liam Fox and Boris Johnson be permitted to talk publicly about a Brexit dividend when the fiscal forecasts under which the Chancellor of the Exchequer is duty-bound to budget tell us that there won't be any money in excess of what we currently have? So that they're, they're literally economically speaking, there isn't any money to turn into a dividend, and yet when they talk about Brexit dividends, they go largely unchallenged. How have we ended up in this position? That's my question, because I don't think, with a straight face, anybody could argue that it isn't a disaster, what I've just described to you, or at least a, a, an almighty mystery. John's in St Albans. John, what would you like to say? Morning, sir. Oh, um, you said, uh, permitted, how is Johnson allowed to do this? Well, he's allowed to do this because he's boss, the Prime Minister, simply so doesn't have the power to stop him. Um, she is like the Queen. Um, no power whatsoever, ahead of the government, ahead of state, but can't control, has no power at all. The it feels like is, that now, doesn't it? I, and and like, oddly, it, I, I think my, my, my forlorn quest to find things upon which everybody can agree on in this horribly fractured and divided country at the moment, that's probably quite a good example because, of course, the people still waiting for their unicorns to arrive think that it's Theresa May's fault their unicorns haven't arrived, so they're having a pop at her as well. And then the people who are waiting for reality to be admitted are having a pop, a pop at her for continuing to postpone the admission of reality. She can't, you know, rock in a hard place. Well, it's a government that is propped up by a party openly endorsed by the combined loyalist military command. I read somewhere... <laughs> We've got enough, mate. Let's just focus on the lane we're in, all right? I mean, I'm not not disputing what you say, but talk to me a little bit about my industry as well, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting really confused. Why, he, why, 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 why is he allowed to do this? Your industry as a whole, television newspapers. Johnson has always been good value. Yes, let's put Johnson in front of a camera. He might say something outrageous. He's like the Howard Stern of politics. Yes. Why do people keep listening? Because he might say something bad. Um, Johnson's been this way for eons, but his own personal agenda of this is that it is the Johnson and the Johnson's people coup d'etat to unseat her and he wants the top job it's boris's gig he always have thought that it's that it's that it's boris's no gig. I, I know i get and all of that but what what confuses me is the I, I don't know and hand on heart i don't know whether it is ignorance or or or, or something more sinister because that explanation i did it was a little bit convoluted it was a little bit round the houses i've double checked it <clears throat> this morning with a couple of uh, experts, there's no other word for it, including Jonathan Portes, who's, um, I, I think, a very interesting commentator on these matters. I don't think anyone can dispute my analysis. The only way that you could punch a supposed hole in it is by arguing that, that we shouldn't trust the OBR. But then I'd just point out that the Chancellor of the Exchequer is legally obliged to act according to their forecasts. Their forecasts say there won't be any money. Boris Johnson and Liam Fox say there will be and will spend it on the NHS. What should journalism be doing at this point? Well, journalism should be getting spreadsheet fill to actually come in and say, right, Mr Hammond, you are the Chancellor of the Exchequer. What do you have to say? But because spreadsheet fill is actually loyal to his PM and his PM... Oh, possibly... do you, do you, I, I don't know. I, well, imagine what really? would happen no, in the well... world. I, 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 I believe this government is so split asunder... But if they could actually stand there and duke it out, they would. They, 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 they're arguing like a bunch of petulant children at the moment to the detriment of the British people and the entire future of this country. And it sickens me to the core. And they get away with it because oh, so many people are shouting, everything's going to be fine. You, I mean, you lost, get over it. That, I presume, is still a thing. Will of the people. So, look, it's reality, reality, reality versus will of the people. You lost, get, you get over it. Ramona's tears. That's it. That's where we are. And the cabinet seems to be split.
split along yeah, those right. lines as well. And because yeah, right. because they are ostensibly members of the same party, they have to keep a lid upon the fractures, otherwise the party would be split asunder just like the country is. John, I'm cracking on to hear some other voices. I've got two phone lines free, plus the one that John's about to vacate. Just talk me through how you think we've ended up in such a stupid place. Such a crazy place, the kind of place that if it was happening in another country, we'd be feeling a little bit smug and superior and almost sort of laughing at them. Tom is in Ottershaw. Tom, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Good morning. Thanks Hello, for taking Tom. my call. Um, I believe we spoke about a year ago about um, uh, or Just, two about... Okay, we've got 90 seconds before the news, Tom. Crack on, okay, mate. OK, fine. The reason um, Boris Johnson can say this is um, simply because he can say what he likes. And the OBR, I know you're going to try and shoot this down, but the, the OBR is constantly wrong. Yes. Um, it forecasts... So why do you think the Chancellor... What, what do you think the Chancellor should rely on? I don't think the OBR should... Uh, it should be linked legally to his, his um, obligations. So what should be? Well, I mean, who's... Because what what what's be beautiful about the OBR is that it, it's independent, as you know. Yes, and it's independently wrong all the time. Which is, which is fine, but what should he rely on instead? I mean, bearing in mind, he, he sets the budgets for all of the Cabinet Minister's departments. What numbers do you think he should use? He should develop his own numbers. Well, then they wouldn't be independent. Yes. So you're saying the Chancellor of the Exchequer should be able to make up his own numbers? No, he should do his own research and develop his own numbers. So, so he should be freed from the independence of the OBR. You, you, you want to have a government-run fiscal forecasting unit that tells the Chancellor what he wants to hear instead of uncomfortable uh, predictions that he might not want to hear. Yes, but the predictions are constantly yes. wrong. You said yes. I said that the predictions of the OBR are constantly wrong. Well, that, that's you know, demonstrably not true. They're not, they're, not per, they're not perfect, but they're, they're fallible, which is why I ask you the question, what would you do instead? And you said, to be clear, you think the Chancellor should, should be freed from independent economic forecasting. Absolutely, yes. Yeah? Okay, no, it's a view, Tom. It, I, I mean, I, I guess that politicians would love that. And in a way, Brexit Britain does seem to be leading us towards a place where politicians are allowed to... Uh, uh, create their own numbers. I'm just surprised that anybody would 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 welcome it. I, I don't. Think, I haven't misunderstood you, have I, Tom? Uh, no, you haven't. But no? when you look at okay. the business, that used its own numbers to plan. And if, if you look at um, yeah. no, I, I've uh, got to go to the news. And that, there is an argument I hadn't considered. I have to be absolutely honest. I, I hope Tom doesn't feel I've shot him down. I, I, I shall inflate his balloon still further. We should have economic forecasts conducted by the actual government that can then tell us, I mean, presumably, under that school of thought, we, we'd have uh, 100 billion, gazillion, trillion, carillion pounds to spend on the NHS. How do you know that? Well, if you look at the economic forecast that the Chancellor of the Exchequer has commissioned from the Chancellor of the Exchequer, you will clearly see that we, we've got, we're, we're all going to win the pools next week. Oh, my days, Tom! Where we are um, trying to make some sense of Brexit. Two stories. The first is... Um, a picture of David Davis at the Cancer Research Laboratory in Cambridge that they released in December. On the 8th of December, it was released by the DEXU. Not, not Christmas Eve, as I suggested earlier. That's because it's the 24th today. I've um, misread my numbers. So, claiming that they're discussing opportunities about cancer research um, uh, thrown up by Brexit. So, we're just trying to find out from them what those opportunities are. David Davis currently speaking to the Brexit Select Committee. And Liam Fox and Boris Johnson currently speaking... A lot of hogwash about a Brexit dividend. Why do I use the word hogwash? Because the Office of Budgetary Responsibilities own fiscal forecasts, which by definition won't be perfect. All economic forecasts are wrong, almost all of the time. It's, it's, uh, it's the best available guess that the Chancellor uses to set his budgets. And under those best available, not guesses, but under those best available analyses, there isn't going to be any dividend of any kind to spend on the NHS or anything else. So my question to you in the first month of 2018 is how have we ended up in a place where one of the great offices of state is occupied by a man who can talk absolute hogwash and go largely unchallenged because this tiny little outpost of the British media is almost as nothing compared to the might of the Daily Mail and the Sun. Um, who will not pick up on any of this because they can't tell their readers that their readers have been conned, largely as a result of the efforts of the Daily Mail and the Sun. So how, how do you think this has been allowed to happen? I, I, I'm sort of finding this fascinating on an academic and professional level, but on a personal level, as a father and a voter, I can't quite believe my eyes. I always presumed that Britain was somehow better than this. So sort of great pride in this country being the mother of all parliaments, and for all its faults and failings, 
The idea that two senior cabinet ministers can appear on televisions and radios and newspapers talking stuff that is so easily unpicked is frightening, isn't it? Even if you're, even if you're still on the Brexit bus, even if you're glued to it, and I understand a lot of people are. I, I have a better understanding of that. If you see the European Union as an enemy, then nothing is ever going to persuade you that leaving is a bad idea. I get that. I, 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 I live alongside you. You know, we, we are compadres, compatriots. You're spectacularly wrong, but that's not a crime yet. So how can anybody be comfortable with the idea? And then, I call it before the news, with, I thought, admirable honesty, said that the only way things could be improved would be if the Chancellor of the Exchequer was allowed to sort of do his own economic forecasts. So I will remind you why George Osborne um, created the Office for Budget Responsibility shortly after becoming Chancellor. He said, at the time, forecasts were fiddled in order to help the government to present the sort of budget it wanted to present. I mean, that was the reason for doing it. Hasn't gone perfectly, nothing ever does. But when he stood up and said, we're setting up an independent body, because, and obviously this was a sly dig at Labour, the last government, recent governments, have fiddled the numbers in order to help themselves to present the sort of budget they wanted to present. So the OBR exists to prevent, according to Conservative chancellors, the OBR exists to prevent all chancellors from fiddling the figures to suit their own political ends. So what are the figures? The figures are, there's no money for dividends. We'll, be, we'll have less coming in than currently goes out towards the EU. This is, this is surely a morning on which we can all agree, apart from the, the, the school of thought, which I happily acknowledge, that wants to go back to the days that George Osborne describes as allowing governments to fiddle forecasts in order to help themselves to present the sort of budget it wanted to present. So by all means, fly the flag for that. But apart from that, apart from that position that Tom explained, who, who can be happy with this? And perhaps more uh, likely to solicit a response. Who, who can explain to me how this has been permitted to happen by an informed and engaged electorate? James is in Barnes. James, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, it defies belief, quite frankly, and I think that this, as, as, as bad as Mr. Trump is with his fake news, which I would say there's an analogy here mm -hmm. about the people who are Brexiteers, the Mr. Davises, the Mr. Johnsons, the Mr. Farages of this world, at least Mr. Trump won't be here in the future. But unfortunately, the damage that these group of people uh, insist on uh, uh, pushing through will last forever. And I think that in answer to your question, in my yes. opinion, is it is about fake news because it seems to me the more the facts are presented to Mr. Farage, to Mr. Rees Mogg, the more that they let, let, let's let's focus on the, the pol hole. let's focus on the politicians that are in charge rather than the sort of professional hecklers and pantomime dames. Yeah. So Johnson and, and Fox in this case would yeah. be the people that have marched around either not knowing or not caring that what they are saying is demonstrably untrue. Of course they know that it's not true. Do they? Like they Do they? You're more cynical than I am. I... The NHS. It's yeah. because the, the, the propaganda sprouted by, as you say, the Daily Mail. And in fact, as I said to your presenter, your station at LBC allows Mr Farage mm. to propagate his Brexit propaganda ad nauseum every night for an well, to, hour. To be fair, we're not... We're, all right, I mean, maybe an hour puts us in a slightly exceptional category, but in terms of allowing him to do it... I don't, I don't think we're unique among British media organisations. I think it's hard to find one that doesn't give him a, a, a regular platform, is it, isn't it? I mean, col columns in the Telegraph, season ticket on Question Time. I, I, that kind of media exposure, while simultaneously claiming that the media somehow are, are, are opposed to that position. It would be funny if it wasn't so sad. Uh, but I stress again, I don't want to talk about the hecklers and the, and the kind of pantomime dames. I want to talk about the actual people in power, because I'm used to, to, to liars lying, and I'm used to propagandists propagandising. I'm not used to cabinet ministers saying things that, that can be... I, I almost want... I, in fact, I do, as a, as, a, as a Democrat and a citizen, I, I almost want someone to show me the flaw in my own thinking, because... It's so patently obvious that what Fox and Johnson are doing is false. I can't quite understand how they're allowed to reach the end of an interview or reach the end of a, of a newspaper article without having their um, proverbial pants pulled down and being spanked from here to next Thursday. I just don't get it anymore, James. 
I, 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 I'm at a loss as, as much as, as you. It is, it is just staggering. It defies belief. It is, it's when you, it's the, it really is the same as the facts presented to Trump that he just says, no, I never said that. No, no, no that never happened. So it, it's basically, you just deny it. And uh, you hope that enough people who are foolish enough or ignorant enough or don't want to know the reality of the situation, as you use the analogy, it's as if the more people know that they're going to they're going to be dead when they go off at the end of the cliff, yes. the more they want to continue on that journey. And it does feel like will of the people. You lost, get over it. Ramona says, look, here's some evidence. You lost. No, no, no. You, you, you've lost. Well, no. that's, yeah, exactly. The will of the people. <laughs> It's misnomer. It's like Brexit means Brexit. The will of the people, it, anybody would think it was a 70%, 30%. 48% didn't vote. And, uh, and I, I, the only thing I would say, uh, which does annoy me, mm. the MPs who for two-thirds are against Brexit really have got a lot to answer for. Because when that lady won the, 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 the court order to, to have 50, Article 50 uh, 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 heard in Parliament, the MPs really have a duty to this country, not to their party. This is about... Well, the they, this is crush the saboteur's territory. ...out there and then, and that would have been the end of it. This is crush the saboteur's territory. If, if, if MPs deign to exercise their own sovereignty, their, 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 their parliament, if they want That's to be... That's what should have done. Uh, they really? Emblems of a representative parliamentary democracy. They vote according to their conscience and their judgment, but the Daily Mail has decided they're not allowed to. Do you know what I'm going to do, James? This is my one little contribution to the, to the national pageant. Yes, sir. There's so many of these politicians live in mortal fear of being done in by the Daily Mail or the Sun. As, mm -hmm. someone, who, as someone who has been on the receiving end of attacks from both of those newspapers, I'm going to offer seminars at the House of Commons on, on why it really isn't like being attacked by a lion. It's like being attacked by a rabid gerbil. Yes, I, I think that the, I think that your attitude towards the Daily Mail and the Sun. I think you, the fact that they're attacking you, James, in, in a way is me, me. Uh, you know, this is a show that historically we'd have been talking about parking tickets and window cleaners. That's right, uh, but they're uh, attacking you because you frighten them because you're one of the voices. Uh, that stands to st that chooses to stand It's up. not a voice, is it? I'm just an echo. I'm an well, echo of the absolutely. facts. An echo of the facts. And you sit there, and, and I, I, I'd like to m modestly dismiss James's claim, but why on earth would the two best-selling newspapers in the country give a hoot about little old me? Why? Genuinely. Whether you think I'm the Messiah or whether you think I'm Beelzebub incarnate, why the hell would they care so much? My Twitter account making national news which I, I either I, can be explained by something currently beyond my ken or is evidence of just how few places are sharing facts with you. And these are the facts under discussion today. The Chancellor of the Exchequer is bound to follow the forecasts of the OBR. The OBR was set up by a Conservative Chancellor of the Exchequer to prevent governments from, in his words, fiddling forecasts to suit their own budgetary desires, i.e. political reasons. Their independence is thus enshrined. They have modelled the economy and concluded that by the mid-2020s, the Treasury will have less money to spend than it currently does. And yet two cabinet ministers whose spending is determined by those budgets set by that chancellor who's duty bound to follow those forecasts by that independent office they're walking around the country unchallenged claiming that there's going to be extra money in the same period that they would be able to spend on the NHS I'll oh, go on clip that stick it on the internet and well the facts aren't shifting and, and I don't understand anymore how you could be comfortable with it. How, how anybody could be comfortable with Liam Fox and Boris Johnson talking about a Brexit dividend when the independent office um, uh, of budget responsibility has provided the Chancellor with economic forecasts he's duty-bound to follow that make it quite clear that they don't believe, which means the Chancellor hasn't modelled for there being any extra money in the period. Um, uh, mid-2020s, that these two characters claim that they'll be able to give extra money to the NHS. That, that, I, I, I've almost forgotten what the past was like, pre-referendum. Still also trying to get an answer on precisely what um, benefits to cancer research David Davis was discussing when he visited cancer research in Cambridge in December 2016. The, uh, 
A uh, date seems to have caused some confusion, not least to me. But I'm really keen to know, because I've been bombarded today with cancer experts and scientists telling me that they don't know a single colleague who thinks that things are going to get better um, and they are almost unanimous that things are going to get worse. And this is what I think we have to start picking up on. And I wish we didn't. I wish someone else was doing it. How can you put a picture up from a government-funded department saying that they're discussing opportunities that will be created by Brexit? without telling us what the opportunities are. And, and to be fair, they've now had uh, over a year to work it out, so there'll be an answer forthcoming from them, I am absolutely sure. Back to the Chancellor, the OBR and the Foreign Secretary. And this curious thing that's happened to my industry, uh, how can Liam Fox be allowed to say things about how he's going to spend money that his own Chancellor um, doesn't think is going to exist? That, that's what confuses me. And Tom in Ottershaw, and I'm not mocking him or, or criticising him, I, I think he's frightening in his suggestion that we should give the government more power to tell us what they want us to hear. Um, but that is the only valid response so far, is take the power away from the independent OBR that George Osborne set up specifically to stop governments fiddling the figures and give the power to fiddle the figures back to the government. I paraphrase him slightly, but only very, very, very slightly. 10.53 is the time. Nick is in Cheltenham. Nick, what is going on? Well, you, you ask um, how politicians um, can deceive, especially, uh, in, particularly in this case, Boris Johnson and... Liam, Liam Fox. Fox, yes. Let's, well, let's concentrate well, on them, because they're the two yes. talking about the Brexit dividend. I, I think well, some Brexiters well, are beginning to wobble, aren't they? And they're going to be trying to claim, oh, it could have gone brilliantly if only, you know, Gunga Din had been in charge. Well, the way they, they do it is by using techniques. And they're all trained, these people. Oh, I'm come all on. Me they're all media trained. Oh, maybe yeah, media trained, yes. There, there's a book. Um, uh, am I allowed to name the book? Which oh, I, I think so, yeah. Uh, Last time I checked. Straight and, it's called Straight and Crooked Thinking. It was written a, a long time ago, but it's been updated, I think. It lists 37 dishonest tricks that you can use in an argument. And it, it, the summary says how to um, diffuse them. And the very first one in the, in the whole book is the use of emotionally toned words. So the NHS is a, a, an emotional thing. So if they say, oh, we get this for the NHS, people say, oh, we can't argue against that because um, people will, will think we're uncaring and, and so, so on. So it's mother love and apple pie. Somebody says we should it, spend more money on the NHS. The idea is that you don't examine whether or not there is any money. You just either boo if you're a callous, heartless beast or you yes. cheer if you care about poorly people. Yeah, so it brings in emotion into it. Uh, and the antidote to that is dealt with by translating the statement into emotionally neutral words. Is this a bit like Arthur Schopenhauer's art of always being right? Uh, I don't know. Because <laughs> that, 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 um, that, that sort of 38 stratagems to win arguments even when you're wrong. Uh, and I suspect it, it speaks to a similar narrative as, as the book that you're describing. But, but I, yeah. I, I, I understand that process. Um, uh, but what I don't... No, no, we're going to run out of time. So I understand the kind of um, neuro-linguistic programming or appealing to the emotion rather than the intellect. But, but what I'm really puzzled by now is the fact that the curtain is so easily pulled back by your political toto. And the old man pulling the buttons and pressing the levers is so totally exposed. And yet a significant swathe of the British public, and more worryingly for me, and I suspect for you, the British media are still pretending that the Wizard of Oz is great and mighty and ignoring the old man behind the curtain. That's what I don't understand. I understand the tactics that the old man behind the curtain has used to persuade people that the Wizard of Oz exists, and that would be contained within your book, Straight and Crooked Things, within the art of always being right. Contained in, you'd probably go back to Machiavelli, actually, and, and, and read The Prince. There'll be some of the tactics in there. But now we've pulled the curtain back. Like today, for example, now we've just drawn a very simple line from the Chancellor, from the old Chancellor to the OBR to the new Chancellor to the budget, to the so-called Brexit dividend, the old man has been exposed, and yet people are still worshipping the wizard. Explain that to me, if you can. Um, <laughs> yes, that, that, <laughs> that, 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 that is tricky. I, I think it's become very tribal. As yes. Well, we're a very disunited... But there's the old man. Um, I don't care what tribe you're in. Over there, look, the old man behind the curtain. There he is. Football, actually. Like in football, yes. um, I, I, I think you have, you have two, two sides. And if there's a terrible foul... Um, 
say one side does a terrible. All, all the fans say, "Oh no, that that shouldn't be a penalty," and, and it, it's um, and, and vice versa. But even there, and I've used this analogy myself. I think it's brilliant. I think the whole world has become blue and red, and and, and it doesn't matter who, what you do or how you play. If if you're on my team, you're brilliant. If you're on the other team, you're a scumbag. But even then, once Lineker's got his hands on it, and they've been over the tape several times in the match of the day studio, even, even then, a lot of people who desperately wanted to believe that it wasn't a foul are going to have to admit that it was. When they're shown the x-ray of the striker's broken leg, and the footage that shows the defender was three feet away from the ball, that we see now to our 52% of the country still swearing blind that it wasn't a foul. Well, um, it, it, pe people are easily led. I, are I, they, though? I mean, th then we're back to this weird phenomenon of people who actively want to be lied to. And the more they're lied to, the more they insist on believing the next things to come out of the liar's mouth. Nick, thank you. I, I apologise for uh, getting a little overexcited there, but I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of analogies, <laughs> particularly the football one. Anyone else make sense of this? Nigel is in Cock Fosters. Nigel, come on, mate, over to you. I'm, this isn't a political statement, but I'm coming from having been a chartered surveyor. Are you in when charge of the well, A chartered surveyor. Uh, no, it just sounds like you're in charge. There's a, there's a rather charming echo. Can we oh, do something about I'm it? In a, I'm, in, I'm in a bathroom shop. Carry on. Trying a bathroom. <laughs> Carry on. I'm so sorry. No, um, that's, I love it. Point, do you want to sit down? Okay. You could sit down if you want. They, they, they let you I'm sit on the uh, appliances. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my point is, when I did valuations on commercial or residential properties, it was today's value. Yes. And then you'd have all the um, press, the estate agents, the estate gazette, arguing that my figures were lower or higher than they could have been. Of course. So I don't... Uh, so my, my point is, if early, um, Boris Johnson is now claiming there's more money than the OBR are suggesting... He's he's not he's not he's not being that detailed. He's not he's hoping we won't look at what the OBR is suggesting. He's simply stating that there is money to spend without having any evidence of where it's going to come from. And, I, and I've used the word fallible. I've used the word fallible countless yeah. times this hour to to stress the fact that no economic forecast is infallible by by I mean by definition. So the problem isn't that, the, you know, if Boris Johnson had pulled out some figures and said, well, I think you'll find there's an alternative analysis here that explains how there will be extra money left over, then, then, then it would be similar to, to what you describe, I think. But I'm not sure it is I at the think. moment. Okay, actually, that was my point. No, and, 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 and no, it's a great point, and, and it is a valid point. But of course, depending, you have to make a decision on which forecast you're going to believe, and the criteria you employ for making that decision, it seems to me, should include expertise and independence. And the Office of Budget Responsibility was set up precisely to provide independence, and it's chock full of expertise. But they'll make loads of mistakes, and, and you can send them to me and point out historical and future errors made by all the economic forecasters on the planet. That's why I've chosen the one that the Chancellor has to follow when he's setting the budgets for the departments currently run by Liam Fox and Boris Johnson. So when the budget was written, they didn't turn around and say, hang on a minute, uh, you can afford to give me double what you've just budgeted for the Foreign Office budget. You can afford to give me double, which is effectively what they're saying today, albeit that the money ends up in a different pot. I do